so I'm going to go ahead and begin. We're starting about 20 minutes late, which is how late the, um, the original conference started. My name is Karen Plumby. I am a professor of biophysics in the T.C. Jenkins Department of Biophysics at the Homewood Campus in the Jenkins Building. Um, I'm also the director of undergraduate studies for the biophysics major. And I'm going to talk about achieving gender equity in STEM uh, today. So what this will be is a um, journal club style presentation of selected government or societal studies and also will include literature from the social science from the social sciences. I want to just point out that this is mostly US based literature because gender equity in STEM uh, varies by country. It's much different in Switzerland and Sweden than the US, but mostly this literature today is US based. And I also want to point out that it's somewhat focused on the professoriate. So I'm a professor. I care about teaching students and training students and um, encouraging women students in STEM. So um, that's what my focus is. And when I decided to uh, start giving presentations about this, the main motivation was that I wanted to open a dialogue on women of achieving gender equity in science, and I especially wanted to open a dialogue with young women so that they would be aware of, of the issues in science. So I will quote a number of uh, literature citations today. They're all on the blog that I have now um, established sort of long today, but it's the one from today. Um, so you don't have to like scribble down the references really quickly. I'm going to start with the National Academy study that was published in 2007. It's a, it's a fabulous uh, piece of work that was uh, put together by a committee on maximizing the potential of women in academic sciences. You can read this online for free. Here's the short link. You can even buy the book. This is what the book looks like. And it's, uh, it's quite long. It's 346 pages. It's a, it's a fabulous, fabulous study that anyone, faculty or student, in areas of STEM should read. And it came out at a, an extended time in my career uh, because I was under consideration for tenure here in 2007. And um, it was really important, an important read for me at the time. And I'm going to um, just talk about some of the findings from this study. We heard this morning uh, also women are equally qualified. There are many studies that show that, that they have the ability and drive to succeed in science and engineering. Yet women are lost in every educational transition, from the undergraduate to the graduate transition, from the graduate to the postdoc transition, from the postdoc to the faculty transition. And although the pipeline of women has reached gender parity in several fields, and the pipeline meaning the number of women in undergraduate level is paired, it's equal to the number of men. Women atop research institutions represent only 15% of full professors. That was in 2007, because it comes from the National Academy study. More recent data from the National Science Foundation shows that the increase in women full professors appears to be linear. And it's increasing at a rate of 0.73% per year. So I think the next generation of women have hope for parity in the sciences. Um, this data is all online at the National Science Foundation website, and there's lots of other data online about underrepresented minorities in, um, and people with persons with disabilities in science. Additional findings, women are likely to face discrimination in every field of science and engineering ranging from biology to computer science. So psychology, the soft sciences, all the way up to the hard sciences, physics, and engineering. Most people, both men, women, and men, hold implicit gender biases. We heard this this morning in the keynote talk. And this is um, it's a little hard to take for women in science who feel like they're being discriminated against. But it will go over a study that shows that even in science, this is true. And part of the problem with women, advancing women in STEM, is that the evaluation criteria contain arbitrary and subjective components that disadvantage women. And we'll go over some of those today. And 
finally, women in junior positions felt that gender bias would not threaten their future careers. This is a really important finding from the study, um, I think, because it affects how young women think about their potential in science. But in contrast, women in tenured to senior positions felt themselves marginalized within their departments. This is a study from MIT. This is exactly how I felt coming up for tenure. This is a thought that is recapitulated in the Vision 2020 study. So one of the problems of the National Academy study is that it offered few solutions. It was a, it's a wonderful read for explaining what the problems are and for a compilation of studies, but it doesn't offer very many solutions. Um, Vision 2020 was a study uh, commissioned by Hopkins that was published in 2006 and came out about the same time and it recapitulated many of the National Academy study findings. And if you'd like to read this full report, which is also quite lengthy, it can be found here. So categories of potential barriers. Um, the first one that receives a fair bit of discussion is lifestyle choices and institutional inadequacy. So often you hear that women leave science because childbearing years coincide with training and early faculty years. And this is compounded by the fact that many institutions still do not have affordable and convenient child care. And although these are extremely important um, issues, this is not what I'm going to talk about today. What I'm going to talk about today are potential barriers that are related to women in their personal sense, not related to um, women in this institutional sense. So I'm going to talk about bias, unconscious bias against women, <coughs> the expectation bias, what we expect from women, the confidence gap that women show as compared to men, which has received quite a bit of press recently because there's a new book out, and two points of leverage in a woman's career that may influence her retention and success in STEM. So bias, we heard this morning a very similar definition of unconscious bias. So in the social psychology literature, bias is an error in decision making. And with respect to gender, it's a preference for males over females that is not intentional and that does not stem from a conscious desire to impede the progress of women in science. So the women before me had uh, overcame the challenges of conscious bias against women, and now the, we are faced with the unconscious bias. And one of the most interesting questions you can ask is whether or not science faculty display unconscious bias. And you could say, science faculty? How could science faculty display unconscious bias? We're rigorously trained to be objective to look at the data, to evaluate the data for what it is, and to make decisions based on that. So um, Joe Handelsman asked this question, do science faculty display unconscious bias? And um, one of the points that she brings out in her introduction to her paper is that people who value their objectivity and fairness are paradoxically particularly likely to fall prey to biases, in part because they're not on guard against subtle bias. So we science faculty feel like we're so fact-oriented, we don't even consider the possibility that we could not be fact-oriented. All right, so this study, which is known colloquially as the Joe Hamilton study, was published in 2012 in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences, which is a very prestigious journal in the science field. And I want to just tell you a little bit about the details of this study because it, I think understanding the study in detail is really important for appreciating the outcome. So it was a randomized, double-blind study that in the end included 127 faculty. The faculty were biology, chemistry, or physics professors. They were drawn from three public and three private R1 institutions in the U.S. So R1 um, relates to the amount of, and I, of that funding that is supporting the, the research at the university. And so, in a sense, it's geographically diverse. 
within the U.S. And I want to point out that each of the public and private institutions was paired in a geographical location. So for example, if one of the private schools was in Maryland, then one of the public schools was also in Maryland, just to avoid regional uh, bias. Um, the demographics on the faculty participants agree with national averages. So the uh, faculty uh, in the 127 were 74% male, 26% female, 80%, 81% were white. Here are the specific uh, breakdowns. The mean age was 50.34, and the age ranged from 29 to 78. The faculty were uh, distributed in this manner, 18% were assistant professors, 22% were associate professors, and 60% were full professors. Okay, and 40% were biologists, 32% physicists, and 28% chemists, which I think is very interesting because there are more, on average, more women in biology than in physics, and yet this study um, will show us that the women faculty do display unconscious bias against um, women applicants. So the way the study worked was that faculty received an email survey and were tasked with two main evaluation metrics. They were to rank a potential lab manager candidate <coughs> for competency, hireability, and mentoring. Would they mentor this applicant? And they were also to choose a starting salary. Um, they did not know that they were part of the study, but they thought they were really evaluating a real applicant, and that's a key part of the, of the um, work. The application that they received was designed to reflect a high but slightly ambiguous competence. So it was an applicant who had received their bachelor's degree, was going to work for, as a lab manager for a couple of years, and then go on to graduate school. But the, and the application was strong, but not unquestionably strong, right? It wasn't superbly excellent that you couldn't argue. There were places for argument. The name of the application included was either Jennifer or John. So half the faculty received an application from Jennifer and half received an application from John. So gender female or male. And um, these names are both great, you know, uh, evaluated to be both have equal likability and equal recognizability. Okay. The ethnic background of the candidate was Caucasian and the age was 22. They had just graduated with a bachelor's in science, obtained May 2011 from some unknown university. And their GPA was 3.2, so good, but not the top. They had GRE scores that were strong, but not the top. They had received, you know, some awards not the top awards. Um, they were in good standing, but they had withdrawn from one class prior to the finals and a W on their transcript. So kind of a report. Um, and they had three letters of recommendation, two from former faculty research supervisors, and one from an intro science professor. It was pretty typical. Um, and they were all supportive. The letters and the application are included in the supplementary material for the paper, if you go and pull the paper online. So the future plans of the student were to apply to doctoral programs. All right. And the reason why a student at this level was chosen for the application was because this is a critical time in keeping women in the pipeline. So this is after the bachelor's degree, before they go to graduate school, and what happens in this critical time when women and men choose to go to graduate school. All right, they have some activities. And they're going to be a lab manager. It's pretty typical to be a lab manager. So competence. Competence is scaled from one to seven and assessed using three questions. Did the applicant strike you as competent? So um, one is not at all, seven is the best score. How likely is it that the applicant has the necessary skills for your lab manager position? One to seven. And how qualified do you think the applicant is? And then the scores, the responses, were averaged from the student competence scale um, with higher levels, indicating greater levels of perceived competence. Okay, so seven is the best. So these, were, these three questions were answered, and then the score was averaged. 
Higher ability, one to seven. How likely would you be to invite this applicant to interview for a laboratory manager job? How likely would you be to hire the applicant for a lab manager job? And how likely do you think it is that the applicant was actually hired for a lab manager job? Okay, same thing, scored on these three and average. And willingness to mentor. If you encounter this student with these statistics at your institution, how likely would you be to encourage the applicant to stay in the field if he or she was considering changing majors? So in your position, in your faculty position as an advisor, how would you advise this person? How likely would you be to encourage the applicant to continue to focus on research if he or she was considering switching to their focus on teaching, which is traditionally a female field? And how likely would you be to give the applicant extra help if she or he, if he or she was having trouble mastering a difficult concept? So they were scored in average. So here are the results. Both men and women faculty showed gender bias favoring the male applicant. So let me take you through this. The confidence score in blue here for the male candidate is four. For the female candidate is about 3.25. And these are the combined results for man, for male and female faculty, but there were no differences. The statistical, um, the statistics are stronger when you combine the male and female faculty, but they have that data and there were no difference between men, male, and female faculty. Higher ability. The male candidate was more scored higher on higher ability than the female candidate mentoring. The male candidate was the worthy of mentoring more than the female candidate. Remember, these are exactly the same applications, exactly the same. The only thing that's different is it's Jennifer or John, male or female, male or female pronouns used for that throughout the manuscript to match the gender of the applicant. Salary. The, um, Faculty mem members, the people who were answering the survey, were asked to choose a salary, and they had to pick one of these. And here's the salary breakdown. Both men and women faculty offered females lower starting salaries. So the average for um, the male candidate was a little over $30,000 per year. The average for the female candidate was about $26,500 the exact same applicant with the exact same qualifications. Right, so I plotted it like this with this scale, you know, it emphasizes the drama of the result. This is how it's plotted in the paper. And one thing I'd like to point out is that um, there is something good about women in science in that the average um, pay gap for women in the U.S. is 80 cents on the dollar, but in science here it's 87 cents on the dollar. So there's a little bit better, but still this is shocking. And it's particularly shocking for a young woman because they are going to rely on um, these, their senior peers to evaluate them as a scientist. And even if they're as good as men, they can't, uh, they're not evaluated on the same scale. Okay, so why, why are science faculty evaluating male candidates better than women candidates? And I think it relates to the expectation bias. Um, so this is called schemas this morning. So social psychology research tells us that people rely on cognitive shortcuts to make evaluations. And what are cognitive shortcuts? Those are what they think they know about categories of people. Right? So what, you, what we all think we know about men versus women in this case. So what do people expect? Women should be warm and nice and kind and not dominant and not assertive. Women are thought to be slightly more capable at tasks requiring nurturing. Men, on the other hand, should be action-oriented and assertive and not modest and not weak. Men are thought to be slightly more capable at most tasks, especially mechanical, mathematical, 
or leadership tasks. So this is the expectation bias that comes with the male or the female candidate. And the problem with this is that it causes us, all, all of us, to use a different standard when we're evaluating a man versus a woman. So for example, when a man performs well in a traditional male type task, this performance is what we expect. So we're happy with it, and his status goes up. But when a woman performs well in a traditional male type task, she's confusing us because this performance runs counter to our stereotypic expectations. And as a result, her performance is really scrutinized, overly scrutinized, and as a consequence, women are required to repeatedly prove their confidence. Over and over again, they have to prove that they're good enough because they're, they're going against the, their gender expectation when they're um, working in a, in a male type task. For example, women are less likely to get credit for their ideas. So the, the cartoon here is about a meeting, it could be a faculty meeting, it could be an admissions meeting, it could be all kinds of meetings. If a woman makes a suggestion, often the room goes silent. And then it'll pick up and then everyone will start talking again. And then a few minutes later, a man at the table will make the very same suggestion. And then it's a great idea, right? So this is a cartoon, but this really, this really happens, okay? Expectation bias affects, as a woman, our status and our job success, right? So I'm gonna go over some research from a paper that was published in 2008. And this paper discusses status conferral. And what this is, is a socially perceived judgment that can be used to rank a job candidate's status or a person in the job status, their power and independence that he or she deserves in a future job. Okay. So in this study, 39 males and 30 females were asked to watch a videotaped job interview of either a male or a female professional describing anger or sadness. So they were, the, the person in the video is either describing anger or sadness, and it's either male or a female candidate. And this is a study in the professional world. It's not necessarily a scientific study, but it speaks to gender expectations. Just to make sure, the female and the male targets, the people being videotaped, were pre-tested to be equivalent in attractiveness, age, and ethnicity. Okay. So that shouldn't those three should not play into the score that the candidate receives. And the targets, the people in the video, were scored on status, attribution, which I'll explain in a second, salary, and competence. And I want to specifically talk about um, the status conferral with respect to this display of emotion. So when a man in the video expresses anger in the workplace, or about something in the workplace, his competence and his status conferral goes up. He is seen as more reliable, um, and he, he is a leader because he's a However, there's an expectation that women will not express anger publicly, and the exception to this is when they're scolding young children. Right. So when a woman expresses anger, she violates the feminine norm. She violates the gender and her status conferral goes down. So a woman expressing anger or sadness in the workplace loses you know, status in the workplace, loses credibility, loses, loses their judgment of confidence. Part of that is related to the attribution, so internal versus external. So when a person's behavior is characterized to be high consensus, that is consistent with the peer group or the gender group, the social perceivers are likely to attribute the behavior to external reasons, okay? So anger expressed by a man is perceived as stemming from the situation. The, man, the male is angry about something that's happening. He has identified a frustrating situation. What a leader, we want to hire this guy, we're going to promote this guy. It's wonderful to have this person on our team. So his Anger 
is externally attributed to something that's happening in the workplace. In contrast, when a woman's, when a person's behavior is characterized to be low consensus, it's different from that of its peers, then social perceivers are likely to attribute the behavior to internal characteristics. Okay, I, think, I know you can see where this is going. Anger expressed by a woman is perceived as stemming from her internal disposition, right? As opposed to features of the situation that she's angry about. She's an angry woman. We do not want to be around that woman. And when a woman gets angry, you got to avoid her. Don't have a conversation with her about what she's angry about. Just avoid her. And her status conferral goes down. Okay? The same is true for sadness. A woman crying versus a male crying. If a male crying raises his status in the workplace, before a female, it lowers her status. And um, John Stewart actually has a wonderful video uh, on this. He calls it, these broads must be crazy. And this video was published, in, it was on one of his episodes in 2011 during the presidential campaign after Hillary Clinton teared up in a, um, after one of the voting uh, episodes. And so uh, the pundits all said, she can't be the leader of the free world, she cries. And um, John Stewart has a really great satirical video about this, showing all the many Congress crying, but it's not a problem for them. All right, so if you have a student in your office, it's a male student versus a female student, you're, as a faculty member, if you're not aware of your gender bias, you will likely think, oh, this female student, she really needs to get it together. And the male student, you know, you'll be doing everything you can to help him solve this external problem that he's having. Okay, that's the, the bias that one might have, one could have without awareness. So what can we do to break this? Um, we have to break the tendency to use stereotypes as cognitive shortcuts. And I think the way to do this is awareness. Uh, we have to educate ourselves about stereotypes so that we can scrutinize our own decision making. Women must do this just as much as men. Women display unconscious bias just as much as men do. So even though um, we're a woman, it doesn't guarantee that we're not going to display bias against a male and female candidate coming into our office. One of the most important things we can do is to establish clear criteria and qualifications ahead of evaluation. It's really, really important to have clear criteria so that one can use those clear criteria in an objective way to evaluate applicants or students or candidates. And scrutinize the criteria that you're using when making hiring and promotion decisions. Ask yourself, somehow, is this criteria that I set up, is this really objective? Or does this, um, is this biased against men or women in some way? Um, and an example of this is Carnegie Mellon has dramatically increased the number of women computer science majors by just removing a prerequisite, a proto-computing class that was previously required. So now they offer that for women and they get them in the pipeline and the numbers of CS majors have gone up by enormous amounts. Accountability. Hold decision makers accountable. This is really tough after a decision's made to hold decision makers accountable, right? It would be better to use these criteria ahead of time proactively to avoid situations where we need to do this. Transparency is extremely important. Maintain transparency so that everyone knows um, what the criteria are. Make sure they're clear criteria and make sure that they're broadly communicated to everyone so that they know how decisions are being made. Specifically, as a supervisor, you can vouch for the competence of women within your organization. And the key uh, factor here is that you must describe her accomplishments, not her personality. And this will t I'll touch on this again when I discuss letters of recommendation. Okay, the competence gap. Women systematically underestimate their own abilities. Okay? Men systematically overestimate their own abilities. And this difference in how women and men estimate their abilities is harmful to women. Um, 
Sheryl Sandberg talks about this in her book. And there's a new book out called The Confidence Code by Claire Shippen and Patty Kay that discusses this at length. If you test men and women and you ask them questions with answers that have totally objective criteria, like what is your GPA? How well did you do on an exam? How well do you think you're going to do on an exam? Men get it wrong on average slightly high. Women get it wrong slightly low. Right? There are many studies that are cited in this book. And they also have a uh, shorter version of this. There's an article in The Atlantic, published in the April version of The Atlantic. The confidence gap changes how success is attributed. Men attribute their success to themselves. Women attribute their success to external factors. If you ask men why they did a good job, they'll say, I'm awesome. Obviously, why are you even asking me? Right? But if you ask a woman why they did a good job, they'll say, well, someone helped me, and I got lucky, and I worked really hard, and um, I see this over and over and over in our graduate students that we train. I see it sometimes in our undergraduates. Before I have read the literature on this, I did this myself. I was so lucky to get a job at Hopkins. We were so lucky to get these results that we could publish in this PMAS paper. It, you know, yeah, we worked really hard, and, and you know, we never say, well, we thought of it. And then, of course, it had to be that way. Just because as women, growing up, we are socialized not to um, take the credit for ourselves, right? It looks too egotistical. Why does the confidence gap matter? Many reasons. One important reason is that it matters because no one gets a job or a promotion if they don't think that they deserve their own success, right? Or if they don't even understand their own success. For women, and, and men too, right? Probably a lack of confidence is associated with something called the imposter syndrome, which I had never heard of until I read the National Academy study. And this is a syndrome in which people are unable to internalize their accomplishments. So they feel like they're living someone else's life. They don't deserve to have this life, right? Why do I, do I deserve to be a professor at Hopkins writing a review on this you know, technical field that I've been asked to write? It feels very intimidating. I want to get it right, but I'm thinking, Half the time I'm thinking, oh, I'm not sure that I can do this. And I was very lucky to be friends with another uh, professor here at the time, another woman professor, who said, you need to just get over it. They asked you to write this article because they want to know your opinion. Just accept that. They value your opinion and write the paper. Um, but many women don't know about this. And they don't know how to own their own success. A lack of confidence leads to a lack of action. Men will apply for a job or promotion if they feel they're 60% qualified for the job. Women will not apply for a job until they feel like they're 90% qualified for a job. So women don't act as often in uh, promoting themselves, seeking jobs, seeking new challenges. They're inactive because they're not sure they can do it. What can we do about this? One question, should women just fake it? Do we fake confidence? And I think the answer to that is no, because no one wants us to be um, less than genuine. And, and the social psychology literature tells us that men are not really faking it either. It's just how they were brought up. That's how they answer the questions when they over, slightly overemphasize something. But we should encourage women to take credit for their accomplishments. We should encourage them to use a vocabulary that shows that they own their own success. We should encourage them to uh, be confident in what they do. And we should encourage them to try new things, even if they feel they're not sure they can do them. They should take more risks, apply for jobs. Yeah, they might be turned down, but you'll learn something in the process. And we should encourage our young women, especially at the key points in the pipeline, to um, take these actions. Points of leverage. I just want to finish up with a couple of points of leverage in a woman's career. 
And two of these are letters of recommendations about women um, and speaking invitations at meetings. So letters of recommendation are extremely important at all levels. They are important for fellowship applications for undergraduates applying for fellowships, for postdoctoral fellows applying for fellowships, for young faculty member applying. They are important for obtaining a job. You need letters to get a job. So you need people to write strong letters of recommendation for you. They are important for promotion at the levels of both associate and full professor. To be promoted at Hopkins to the level of associate professor, you must, there must be at least 10 letters from around the world advocating for you as a scholar and a scientist. And those letters need to be strong, and they need to talk about your qualifications and your discoveries. But gender stereotypes affect these. So here's a study, this study here. This is an analysis of 694 letters of recommendation for 194 applicants for eight junior faculty positions. This is in Texas. Um, female candidates were described in more communal, social, or emotive terms. Male candidate, candidates were described in more active or assertive, it's called agentic terms. Okay, so what are these terms? The communal adjectives were defined as affectionate, helpful, kind, sympathetic, sensitive, nurturing, agreeable, tactful, interpersonal, warm, and caring. I don't know about you, but as someone seeking to uh, receive a promotion or a job as a woman, I don't think that these adjectives do a good job of describing my qualifications. The male adjectives, the agentic adjectives, were assertive, confident, aggressive, ambitious, dominant, forceful, independent, daring, outspoken, and intellectual. Right? This one really troubled me a lot because women are just as smart as men are. And for them, for the male applicants to receive letters that describe them as intellectual and the females not to receive these letters is very disappointing. After redacting all the gender information from the letters, the research team then had faculty rate the strength of the letters or the likelihood that the candidate would be hired based on the letter. Okay? So they don't know if it's a male or a female candidate, but it still has all these adjectives in it. And there was a negative correlation between the usage of communal terms and hireability. So letters that include descriptions of a woman's personality and warmth and all those gender expectations that the woman is supposed to meet, those are actually damaging to women. Right? Being communal is not valued in academia. They, no faculty member would really be surprised by this, right? To get a group of faculty to do something is like hurting cats. But still, um, that's how it is. The second point of leverage I want to talk about is speaking positions <coughs> for women at meetings. And these are influenced by the organizing committee. And this study is particularly troublesome because um, a faculty member, when they submit their CV for promotion, has to have external inviting speaking, externally invited speaking invitations, okay? And promotion and tenure committees assume that everyone gets these, you know, in accordance with their level of um, competence in the field, irrespective of gender. Okay, so evidence of external external recognition. And the other reason is that speaker speaker rosters are often a starting point for the planning of future meetings. If you're organizing a meeting and you want to have speakers in a particular area, it's not uncommon to go and review prior meetings of that and see who's giving talks. Third reason is that an invitation frees up grant funds for other uses. If you're invited to speak at a meeting, it often comes with um, a reimbursement of your travel expenses and the registration and housing costs for that meeting. So that's money that you don't have to spend on your own grant to go to that meeting. So you can use those grant funds for other scientific investigations. And finally, women speakers are role models for young women scientists. Right? If there's no women speakers, then the young women in the room don't see someone like them up there on the podium giving talks. 
So an analysis of 460 symposia involving almost 2,000 speakers. So a symposia is a little sort um, set of talks with about four speakers in it. For two large meetings sponsored by the American Society for Microbiology, revealed that having at least one woman member of the organizing the convening team correlated with a significantly higher proportion of invited female speakers and reduced the likelihood of an all-male symposium roster. And here's what the data looks like. So the general ASM meeting, 2011, 12 to 13, women speakers are about 25% if it's an all-male organizing committee, and they go up to 40% if, it's, if there's at least one woman. Only one woman can make this much of a difference. All right, and they have a second conference <coughs> with similar impact. The number of all-male sessions is reduced when women are on the committee. So in 2011, if it's an all-male committee, 35% of the sessions are all-male. If there's at least one woman, then only 8% of the sessions are all-male. So it has a huge impact on women um, giving, getting, receiving speaking slots at a national meeting. The ASM is a pretty big meeting. Okay. One could ask, um, one could, you know, when you are advocating for women to be a speaker at a meeting, then the counter argument to that is that we should pick only based on scientific excellence, right? So, and that's true. Scientific excellence should be the first guiding criterion for the selection of speakers, right? And so then you can ask the question, well, are there enough women for these speaking slots? And I think a useful way of answering this question is to look at success rates for grant funding. So in general, there are not huge disparities between the success rates for women and men in grant funding. Well, that's a little disturbing in 2013, it's going down. Because you can see the trend is, everyone's aware the trend is going down in grant funding. But still, men and women are feeling it to about the same extent. Although women do lag by like one, you know, one percentile each time. So this negates the argument that there are no women out there because women are able to obtain grant funding at similar rates, as success rates. So what can we do about these two criteria? Um, in letters of recommendation, if you're writing letter, letters of recommendation, it's really important to emphasize accomplishments for the women candidate, not personality. Okay? If you're reading letters of recommendation and they're all about personality, then the person writing the letter is obviously not aware of these issues with respect to letter of recommendation. For speakers, if you're organizing or you are involved somehow in a um, science society or in a meeting, ensure that women are represented as speakers at a level equivalent to their participation in the field. And this varies, of course, because there are fewer women in physics than there are in biology. So we're not, it shouldn't be that women are overrepresented according to their participation in the field, but they should be at least equally represented according to their participation. And one way you can do this is to write to organizers with suggestions for women speakers. Having been on several organizing committees, um, it, it's hard if you're the only woman coming up with names. It's, it's, and the men should be coming up with names too, but for, uh, many times it's the women coming up with names for other women. And so if you're in a community, you should just write and suggest, hey, I saw this person or this, this woman's really great. And if you're a woman, you should promote yourself, which goes against your gender expectation, um, but I found that if, if you do this in a nice way, like way, hi, I have this great new work, I'd really like to give a talk at this meeting, you can often be selected for a talk. Okay, so that's those are the points I wanted to cover today. I just want to acknowledge that um, my work here at Hopkins is supported by the National Science Foundation, the NIH, and we have computing time at the National Computer Center. And I'd be Happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, one thing you should realize is this is a selection of studies from the literature. Uh, I've tried hard not to interject my own personal experiences too much. This is not the forum for discussing my own personal history. Um, but I'm really I'm open to ideas on how to encourage other women in science. This is sort of